Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Sean Parker and Tom Silverman. Hello, everybody. Here he is. Sean, we're going to have a little conversation. And we're going we're gonna to start going back. Uh, how many years has it been since Snapster? Gosh, I think it's been like 12 years. 12, yeah. I think it's been roughly 12 years. Right. That's right around the time the music business started to slide. Let's talk about music sharing and how it can save the music business. You, you help create music sharing and collaboration. So sharing and collaboration are watchwords of the New Music Seminar. Most people out here are involved in sharing and collaboration uh, with music and the technology that surrounds it. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you think music sharing and collaboration uh, or collaborative use of music can really help the music business. Well, you know, there's a sense in which, and you'll have to excuse me, I've, I'm just getting over a cold, so if, if my voice starts to fade, I'll just kick it back to Tommy and let him uh, talk for a little while. But um, there's, a, there's a very real sense in which um, you, you know, music sharing and collaboration have always been the heart of music promotion. It's just been, it's been the invisible side of, of, uh, of promoting recorded music. You know, we, we tended to focus on the, the, um, the platforms that we could control, whether that was radio or MTV. Um, basically end caps in retail stores, things that could be controlled. Um, yet that was really just the first step. That was how music was sort of injected into the marketplace. And so much of the actual promotion occurred by word of mouth, occurred through people's dorm rooms, occurred kind of out of sight. So the, the big opportunity for digital music platforms like Spotify and, and like Napster before it um, is that you, you, for the first time, you have the ability to harness and direct the viral, inherent virality of music. So in, in theory, at least, if you can get the services right and if you can get the economic model around it right, in theory, this should present an opportunity to dramatically expand uh, the overall size of the recorded music business. Music is inherently social. Music is better experienced with other people. And so much of the experience of music that we have is in groups with other people. And that's always been hidden away from us uh, in, the, in the recorded music business. It's never been something that you could, uh, that you could see or influence in any way. Yeah, a good example of that is uh, the rise of EDM, which is so much of a group experience. People go to those events, you know, 10, 50,000 people show up because it's the experiential part of it. It's the music and the experience around it. And if we could tap into all of that, there's revenues there as well. Then why do you think it is that the music business has had such a historic fear of cannibalization? Well, I mean, it, it's... You know, without without being without being too critical of the people running the the record labels, um, you know, more than a decade ago, um, I think they had, uh, you know, I think there was a fear-based mentality. <coughs> the um, you know, music record industry people are are not uh, technologists. In fact, they could be in sort of on the spectrum of people from uh, sort of spectrum of of career professions. They could be on the os exact opposite end of the spectrum um, from technologists. Uh, they tended not to fully understand at that time, and I don't fault them for this, because they're, they're, it, what we were doing at Napster was, was so cutting edge, we were operating in a legal gray area, it wasn't actually clear to anybody exactly how it would shake out. Um, I, I think there was a, you know, a, a, a genuine fear of what this would mean for the recorded music business. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, record executives at the time were people who didn't even use computers. To the extent that they used email, their secretary read them their emails and dictated emails back. There may still be some people in record labels who do this today. Um, so, <laughs> I won't name names. But, you know, so, so it, was, uh, it, it was a classic case of sort of the, you know, the, the, the young bucks kind of... Um, waging war on, on uh, the old guard. And uh, the, the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate reality of what took place was that unlike every other format shift, and I do consider the move to digital distribution essentially a format shift, unlike every other format shift, this one sort of ended in catastrophe. It's the only example of a format shift that didn't dramatically expand the overall market for recorded music. When you look around here, you'll see our staff have black t-shirts, and on the back they say, appetite for disruption. And 
It's because we believe that at the New Music Seminar that it's time for us as a music business to stop being the disrupted and start becoming the disruptor again. Because we used to be the disruptor. So musically, we've been disruptive. Historically, jazz was a disruptive music. Rock and roll was a disruptive music for sure. It threatened everybody and everything. Metal, uh, alternative rock in many cases. Uh, hip hop certainly was a disruptive music. And I'd say EDM is a disruptive music right now. Uh, we've also, in the formats, we've been uh, disrupt involved in disruption as well. When we went from the 78 to vinyl LPs and 45s, we disrupted ourselves. When we then moved to cassettes, we disrupted again. When we moved to CDs, we were involved with disruption. Then an outside force came with MP3s and music sharing, file sharing, and, and we became disrupted for the first time, and it freaked us out as an industry. And it's taken us maybe 12 years or 13 years to come around to the point where we're saying, you know what, this, we should have been the ones who did this. And now we're trying to catch up and really do that. And so what are our opportunities now that we've learned this painful lesson and we're really ready to be open and um, share music and make music available in ways that we might have been afraid to just even two years ago? You went through the entire licensing issue in Spotify which was a two-year arduous, expensive, long and painful journey and an unnecessarily long one. Uh, but now the door's kicked open and in the future I believe labels will be much more aggressive in having their music m used much more easily and quickly. And earlier I called for a global database and a global method of b getting access to that database to, the, to use those rights to test and experiment and build businesses that can expand our business. Um, what are the opportunities that you see for, for business, uh, for the music business right now? That well, I, you know, it, it's interesting because you, uh, you know, Tommy mentioned this to me backstage, and it actually sounds very similar to my partner from uh, Napster. His second company, Snowcap, was trying to build an open licensing framework. The, the, ar the argument that I made uh, to, to Sean at that time, um, which I think is still, I think still remains true, is that, uh, you know, you need to lead with a product vision. You know, it's very hard to go to the record labels and ask them for uh, you know, sort of an open, you know, just trust us, give us a completely open licensing framework. You know, the market will, ex will create a thousand variations on this and, and one of them will win. And the, the S Snowcap was kind of trying to do all that business development work up front without a real clear product vision or clear use case. Um, we took the opposite approach at Spotify. Uh, we, we basically, we, we did subject ourselves to two and a half years of very arduous and painful negotiations. Um, but we were leading with a clear product experience. We were probably the only company that, that was willing to endure two years of negotiation to build the product that we wanted to build. And most of these, mo in most cases, um, uh, companies took a standard commercial deal with some minor tweaks that were available based on whatever the legal precedent had been up until that time, maybe the iTunes deal. Um, or certain streaming deals like the old Napster service, but they would take what was given to them, uh, and then they would say, well, these are our constraints. Let's build a product around this. And the right way to approach, um, th this seemed totally wrong to me. I'm mean, basically, every, every great internet product has led with product first, and to the extent they've needed to do licensing deals, they've, they've held out, and they've been stubborn, and they've been a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit arrogant, and they've gotten the licensing that they needed in order to support the product experience that they knew they needed to offer their customers. So one of our, one of our core principles at Spotify was that we would have an ongoing licensing conversation. It wouldn't be a one-off thing. We walk in there, uh, you know, walk in there on uh, Monday, walk out there, uh, do, do a week's worth of negotiation, and next Monday we had our standard commercial deal in place, and we would go build a product uh, in accordance with that deal. We knew that failed. We had 10 years of experience looking at music companies and uh, digital music companies and watching them fail in the market with product, but basically by taking that approach. Um, so I, I think it would be wonderful if we could get to a snowcap-like scenario where there's a more flexible licensing framework uh, and there are th therefore more experimentation can occur. That would be incredible and it would be wonderful for Spotify as well. I, I unfortunately don't think it's very realistic because I think there's too much, there remains too much built-in fear and suspicion. And I think, you know, the, in, in general some record labels actually some people within record labels think that, you know, we've already gone far enough, that, you know, creating a fear, free 
tier of service uh, at, with services like Spotify, uh, an ad-supported tier of service, as an upgrade path to ownership or accessibility or paying for portability is actually you know, sort of far enough. So to the extent that that licensing model is gonna get expanded, I think it's gonna have to happen um, with you know, really smart um, technology companies, product companies that also happen to have a close relationship with the record labels, um, you know, kind of working together on a shared product vision and moving things forward incrementally. I don't really think it has any chance of happening as long as we still call them record labels. You know, as long as the word record is involved, it's not gonna happen. That, that's the whole thing that's built around the old mentality. When we get beyond the record mentality, we open up a hundred billion dollar possibility in the music business. Um, how can the music and publishing industry create something like what would be in technology considered an open API to allow innovators and, uh, and inventors to create music products, either uh, services or products or goods, around new business models that can expand the music business. We need to create some way where anybody with an idea can access the, all of the music in the world and plug it into something that can monetize music on a new level. But right now, we've created roadblocks the size of boulders, like I, I showed in my original uh, talk yesterday. Um, and it's not friction in the system. These are huge road, roadblocks. And only the phalanxes of lawyers that uh, Spotify could uh, pay for were able to get over that kind of a hump. But it shouldn't have to be that hard because maybe it's some Wozniak kid in somebody's garage who's going to figure this thing out and build something that's three times bigger for us than what iTunes is. Well, we, you know, we, we have made some progress towards this at Spotify with our platform. So you know, you're going all the way back to Napster, we always had this vision of creating um, a music service that because it had a, a sort of free, ad, whether it's ad subsidized or it's subsidized by your subscriber base, it's kind of the mechanics aren't really that relevant, but to the extent that you can create a ubiquitous free service, uh, that opens the door to you know, music blogs that can, can actually talk about the music they love and then legally share a link to the music. Maybe it's a single, a single use uh, link, or maybe it's a link back to your Spotify account. But regardless, you have a this ability to have you know music everywhere. Um, we've launched that initially within Spotify's platform um, for a huge ecosystem of really cool applications that um, that have taken advantage of it. And we've also now expanded it with with our Play Anywhere model um, across the web. So now, if you're running a music blog, your sort of you know de facto provider of of music is going to be a platform like Spotify where you don't have to go through all those licensing, uh, you know, jump through all these licensing hoops in order to get, um, you do, do the basic thing you want to do, which is share music with your audience, talk about it, uh, you know, hype it up, get people excited about it. You now have an easy, frictionless way of doing that. I don't think we'll be the only provider of that in the future, um, but we're, we've de we're definitely setting, a, setting that direction. You're um, um, a player at the Founders Fund. Would you say that this less appetite for investments that, in, that require music licenses just because of the difficulty of dealing with them? A chilling effect, say? So, you know, th th this is, this is yeah, yeah, you're sort of, yeah, that, was, that was a very incisive question. Um, the, the, my partners at Founders Fund were, 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 fair, were pretty hesitant to actually endorse this investment, the Spotify investment early on for a variety of reasons, but the, m most of which they, they looked at this graveyard of uh, failed uh, digital music companies over the last you know, 12 years, and it didn't look like a very good market. Um, the, you know, there was, a, there was an element of persuasion that was required even within the fund uh, to get my other partners comfortable with the idea of making this investment. Um, there was, there was quite a lot of fear that the, the record labels and the publishers would never, you know, were, were still not ready to, to do the kind of radical new business deal that they were gonna need to do in order to move things forward. The, the bet that I was willing to make was that we had 12 years of failure to learn from. It was pretty clear what not to do and what didn't work. Some of these companies were really well funded and that the industry had begun sort of a second phase of its decline and was getting to a, a point of desperation where it was actually willing to potentially try some new things. Um, 
I couldn't have imagined, if my partners had thought it was going to be a two and a half year long negotiation process to get, to get launched in the US, I'm not sure they would have gone along with me and done the deal. Um, so, so, you know, the sort of naivete and, uh, and optimism that I had going into it, I think was, was very helpful. Um, and that, you know, there, there, aren't many, there aren't many entrepreneurs who have had a background working in the recorded music business and working around it, who have relationships in that world, who also have experience in consumer internet. There's probably like a half a dozen people who have that, uh, that particular um, background. So I was in a, a pretty strong position to make the argument that this could work. Um, and even still, you know, there was, there was quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of, um, um, uh, you know, fear and suspicion of it. I think other VCs in particular looked at what we were doing and thought, oh, this is another, another failed attempt at trying to, you know, create a digital music company. I, I tend to be very contrarian in my view, and I tend to look at, uh, I tend to look at uh, problems as opportunities. And, and sort of the more failure that exists in a space, that just, that's just accumulated evidence. Um, it's a whole set of things that, I, that, are, that are clearly wrong. Um, and if you can look clearly at that <clears throat> and draw the right lessons from it, it actually it informs your, your thinking. If you, if you were running, if you were the CEO of the biggest record company in the world, what would you do right now? Hmm. What would I do? Um, being the contrarian you are. <laughs> you, you know, I think, I think that I would, I think that I would probably, um, I think I would probably be trying to embrace some version of the model that Spotify is preaching, which is this idea that, um, you know, D Daniel, Daniel Eck actually puts it a little differently. He likes to talk about the access model. I tend to like to talk about ownership, because I actually think that ownership has, doesn't really go away. Ownership is, just gets redefined. So as you go from format to format and platform to platform, I think the consumer still has a notion of ownership. Um, even in the video space, there's, there's always an ownership idea. You, know, you, you, you always have rental and ownership, and they are side by side with each other. Um, I think in the case of music, having some concept of ownership is actually even more important because people build a massive music library, they build playlists, and they experience their music through these bundles called playlists. So they, having, a, having built, you know, the construction of that library is much more important than the building of like a DVD library. You know, people tend not to go back and watch the same movie over and over and over unless it's like one of the handful of movies that are your, you know, your sort of a huge part of your life and that you'll watch a million times. But for the most part, um, with music, you, you actually do listen to the same songs over and over and over. It's, so they're very different consumption habits. So if you, can, if you can redefine ownership successfully as something other than owning a piece of plastic or a piece of vinyl, I think that goes a long way towards informing um, how we should think about this problem. And I, I, th I think what it, the, the, the ultimate solution is that ownership is about paying for portability. It's about monetizing the gateway between the desktop and mobile devices. So you'll spend weeks on Spotify building up your library. You know, some people spend hours a day on Spotify building their library, discovering new music from their friends, running little searches and finding new music, getting recommended music, trying things out. You build playlists. Eventually, you're going to want to take those playlists to the gym. You're going to want to take those playlists with you in the car. You're going to want full portability and access to that music everywhere you go. That's ownership. And whether that's monetized through a subscription service, which is an all-you-can-eat model, or monetized through an a la carte model on the other end of the spectrum, like iTunes, there's actually a middle scenario, which is what I call bundled download, uh, where you're actually you know, buying a certain number of downloads per month in a bundle, um, and those, those then become a part of your permanent collection. So if you're not into the rental subscription model, you can actually you know, buy in bulk. And that's a model that we actually have in Europe, which we haven't uh, launched yet in the US. Um, but I think, you know, having those various different offerings, which are different ways of getting at this idea of ownership. Ownership means access to your music everywhere. It's durable. It doesn't break. It's always there. It's available in every format. It's available in every device. And you don't have to think about it. You, you have a label that you run now, which has 25% of the market share of the world business. That means you generate $6 billion a year in gross revenue, but very little in net revenue. 
almost nothing. In fact, you may be losing money. Um, just 10 years ago, you were making 14, well, you were making about, um, about seven, $10 billion a year, your, your company. How can you get your, your, your shareholders want that, that business to come back? What can you do to make music more valuable, to bring music back in the next five years before your contract runs out? Well, you, you need to get as many people as you possibly can migrated onto these new platforms. Whether the platform is iTunes or whether the platform is something like Spotify, excuse me, you need to be able to, you need to migrate hundreds of millions of people into this world. You need to get them addicted to consuming music in a legal context where there is an, where there is an upgrade path to subscription or payment of, of one form or another. This is, um, you know, there, there's been 10 years of a drought of innovation in terms of, you know, creating a, a model that can actually attract hundreds of millions of people. Is iTunes that because managed, of the block. Uh, the yeah, this is because of the licensing, just licensing mess that we've yeah. been in, and because of residual fear left over from Napster, which was a, you know, a debacle. But the 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 um, the 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 way that the way that you you we ultimately are going to get there is by being open to innovation being open to trying new things, to your point, not taking two and a half years in these licensing conversations, but you know, going along with things a little bit faster. And you, know, you, you, look at, you look at the market, it's sort of broken down into all of the piracy-based users who are you know, sort of sons of Napster, they've, they've, ne they've, got, they've started pirating music in the uh, late 1990s, they've never stopped pirating music, they're basically using rogue services to this day, they're using BitTorrent, um, or whatever they, they whatever the client du jour is, um, and they, you know, they'll never use iTunes. It's too expensive. It's too slow. It's too clumsy. They're just sort of we've lost those people until something like Spotify comes along. We we like to say that we're not really competing with iTunes. We're certainly we've demonstrated we're non-cannibalistic of iTunes sales in a variety of different ways. Um, in fact, we have some good evidence that shows that when we launch things on Spotify um, and promote them, it actually drives download activity on iTunes. But the, uh, something like Spotify actually competes directly against piracy. We're actually able to recapture users from uh, the piracy networks, bring them into an environment where they actually become uh, very addicted to the experience. They have their friends there, they're now sharing with their friends, and now you have the benefit of network effects. So it becomes more difficult to switch as you build your friend network up on Spotify. As it becomes a you know, de facto ubiquitous platform, um, it's actually harder and harder to go back to that old piracy world. So as we can, you know, create more services to lure people into, uh, you know, an environment where, uh, where it's hard for them to ever go back to piracy because piracy is too inconvenient, their friends aren't there, they can't share things openly, they can't, they can't build um, experiences as quickly, their playlists are now st stuck inside something like Spotify and can't be, can't be ported out. All of these things, these kind of barriers to exit, are what need to be created in order to monetize music more effectively. Thank you. I, I have one more question I have to ask. And you're now out of that other role. Let me ask you a question from where you sit. What do you think about the uh, universal um, EMI merger? What's your opinion on that? So, you know, speaking totally as a as a non-representative of Spotify, um, just looking at the industry, I think this gets into the gets at the previous point about about leadership. I mean, we ba we basically have spent 12 years sort of languishing, having a hard time, um, you know, getting deals done. And we're, in, we're this industry that's in transition. I mean, we're, we're basically in a, in a very difficult transitional period. Um, so when you, when you look at the transactions that have happened over the last couple years, whether it was Len, you know, buying Warner Music Group, uh, you know, or, or uh, Universal now uh, in, the, in the process of acquiring EMI, I think ultimately these are really good things for an industry that's, that's in transition that needs leadership. And the only way, you know, to, you, you'd made the point earlier that we need to get to a, a faster licensing framework, we need more experimentation. The only way that's gonna happen is if we have um, the kind of innovative leadership that's willing to drive change. So to the extent that like, you're willing to throw your chips in and, and uh, make a big bet on music at a time when most of the rational world is exiting the industry, I think that's probably a good thing. Wow, thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to say? Because I think we're um, no. Well, thank you very much. Let's hear it for Sean Parker. Thank you. Thank you for spending our time with us.